Welcome to Inspiration and Transformation from the Banks of the Ganga with Sadvi Bhagwati Saraswati, an American sannyasi living at the Parmarth Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, India. Sadvi is president of the Divine Shakti Foundation, a charitable organization bringing education, vocational training, upliftment, and empowerment programs to women and children. Sadvi is also Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance and Director of the world famous International Yoga Festival. Join the musings of an American sannyasi as Sadvi shares the wisdom and teachings of her guru, His Holiness Pujya Swami Chidanand Saraswatiji. Welcome, everyone, to Inspiration and Transformation from the Holy Banks of the sacred Ganga River in the land of Rishikesh, India. We use current reality situations to justify a lack of morality. So as you said, you know, how do we know which to go with, reality or morality, and when they don't necessarily go together? Well, they should go together. Obviously, we have to live in reality, but all of the teachings of values, of morals, of ethics, of of sanskaras, they're not for some fantasy world. It's not about, well, here are the morals and the values for a fairy tale, and then here are separate morals and values for real life. No. The reason that we are given these is to actually live them and experience them in real life. And of course, it's a lot more difficult to live according to one's morals when the reality of the situation tempts you otherwise. It's one thing to say, thou shalt not steal. We will live by astheia. We will live by non-stealing, non-hoarding. It's another thing to walk by money lying around or somebody's jewels lying around and to experience the temptation to steal it. But to stay anchored in the morality and to know just because the universe has put this temptation in front of me not only does it not mean that I should abide by morals, but actually it is a, a test of my morality. So our morality is that, which is there to guide us in our reality. So morality and reality should over, always overlap. Morality that is purely theoretical is nice, it's interesting, philosophy is interesting, looking at, you know, different cultures, different times, their morality, sure. But it's just philosophically interesting. Morality is not really powerful or impactful until it intersects with your reality, until you have to live it. So we should always... Always live morality in reality. Now, that being said, when we are speaking purely theoretically about morals, we have very specific rules and lines that we draw. So, for example, let's take something simple like, thou shalt not kill. Well, it seems... In many cases, it seems like the absolute core morality. Ahimsa nonviolence is the very first of the yamas, the practice of yoga. So thou shalt not kill. A, a morality against violence seems obvious. It seems something that we would have a perfect consensus on in every culture, every situation. 
And yet, occasionally, there are times in which, even within morality, someone's death becomes something that is moral. So, for example, I'm not talking about jihad. I'm talking about times like euthanasia. Someone is dying. They're a terminal patient. Doctors have done everything they can for them. The person wants to die. It's a controversial subject, but on a personal level, if someone's got a terminal diagnosis, if they're going to die very soon anyway, and all they're going to experience is pain between now and then, and you're a doctor, or you're a nurse, or you're someone with the capacity to ease them into a smooth and painless transition, that doesn't feel amoral to me. It actually seems very moral if it's what someone wants. We also know that in self-defense, for example, violence which we all are against, but if you're being attacked, if your life is threatened, if your loved one's life is threatened, societies all over the world, even legal systems all over the world, say violence is wrong unless it's self-defense. So my point is that we've got several situations in which even that which is seen as indisputable morality, non-violence, actually you can think, and I'm sure that if we took all of satsang time today, we could come up with a dozen different examples easily, in which actually the most moral thing to do is to go against what our morality is. Imagine. Imagine that you were living in the time of the Holocaust. And imagine that your Jewish neighbors had come to your house asking for refuge. And you hid them in your closet. And suddenly there's a knock on the door. And the Nazi soldiers are at your door and they say, Do you have any Jews inside? Well, clearly, in a case like this, lying is by far the most moral option. Now, we may be deep, ardent yogis. We may have vowed satya, truthfulness. We may have vowed in our morals and our ethics, never to lie, under any circumstances. We may even be one of those who doesn't even tell a white lie. If someone says, do I look ugly? We may be one of those who say, yeah, you know, you, you really don't look so good. We may be a hardcore, truth at all costs person. But if you've got a heart... And a Nazi soldier stood on your doorstep and said, do you have Jews inside? You'd lie. You'd lie out of love. You'd lie out of morality. There'd be no moral code I can think of in which truthfulness is more important than saving people's lives. And so in just four or five minutes, I've given you a lot of different examples in which morality of the moment requires a different morality than one that we may hold true all the rest of the time. And this is where our moral code, rather than being rooted in a list of laws, a list of rules, a list of commandments needs to be rooted in an internal sense of dharma. An internal sense of knowing 
what is right and what is wrong. There's all kinds of these sort of moral, philosophical questions. You know, if, if you knew that there was a guy and he had dynamite strapped to his waist and he was walking into a crowded market and you knew that he was going to detonate that dynamite, killing hundreds of people in the marketplace. And your only way to stop it was to pull out a gun and shoot him before he went in, would you do it? And like this, there's all sorts of deep philosophical questions that don't really have a right or wrong answer, but that force us to look at the truth that our black and white moral codes may very frequently actually create a situation where we act less morally, less ethically, less dharmically than if we were able to be fluid and flexible in the moment because we were rooted in an inner truth in an inner guidance system, an inner dharma. So when you ask about spirituality and morality, well, spirituality is that which provides the real sense of an inner morality. Tragically, we see a lot of people using spirituality as an excuse to do things that are not moral or as a way to sort of absolve themselves. So it's the, I'll go out and commit the same sin again, and then I'll just go to church and confess. Or I'll go out and sin again, and then I'll just come and have a bath in Mother Gunga. That's not what spirituality is for. It's not a get-out-of-jail-free card. It's not, I'll just do some puja in the mandir, go to confession, have a bath in Ganga, and then I can do whatever I want. Spirituality serves as that, which internally makes us know what is moral, what is ethical in this moment. What is the most dharmic thing to do in this moment? And it may be the same thing that I would have thought years ago. And it may actually be different. But spirituality is that which gives me that knowing. The Bhagavad Gita and the war of the Mahabharata, the whole epic of the Mahabharata, is full of situations that if you pulled them out of context and you changed everybody's names and you changed all the details except the core moral question. And you said, is this right? Is that right? In many cases, we'd say no. But it requires the context of the entire situation to know that it actually is the right thing to do. So lastly... Do not think that spirituality absolves you from morality. When spirituality fills us with ego, when spirituality fills us with blindness, that because I am this or I am that or I do this much puja or I chant this much, this many mantras, that somehow I'm I'm absolved, Or that Ganga is going to absolve me? No. All the baths in Ganga, all the pujas, all of that, it's about transforming my way of thinking. Such that when I emerge from Ganga, who I am is different. Such that I wouldn't do again what I did before. That's where we get absolved because we become free of that ignorance that led us to commit the sin. You're listening to OTRFM. 
part of the IOM Radio Network. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. OM Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single... Circle of Hearts Radio is a sanctuary on the airwaves. Join me, Grandmother Aliyah, in the circle on Sunday, 2 p.m. Eastern, as I share information to both enlighten and nourish your soul. Hi, this is Christina Ricci with Rain. Every two minutes, another American is sexually assaulted. If you or someone you know has been sexually assaulted, you are not alone. Help is just a call or click away through the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Please call 1-800-656-HOPE, that's H-O-P-E, or visit RAIN.org, that's R-A-I-N-N dot O-R-G. Brought to you by RAIN and this station. Welcome back to Inspiration and Transformation. I'm so glad to have you all back here with me. Brother is the the embodiment of devotion, the embodiment of purity, the embodiment of total surrender. One of my favorite stories is a story in which Krishna was unwell. And they called all of the... All of the doctors, they called everyone, and none of the doctors could give the right medicine to Krishna. And he kept getting sicker and sicker day by day. And finally, finally, this very wise physician said, there's only one thing that will cure Krishna of this illness. And that is the dust of the feet of a devotee. So naturally they thought, oh, very, very easy. Yes, we'll easily, Krishna has so many devotees. We'll get dust of their feet easily. And so they went from devotee to devotee. They went from gopi to gopi, asking them, give us the dust to the gopis, to the gopas. Somebody, one of the devotees, give us the dust of your feet. Krishna needs it to be cured. And everyone, even the staunchest devotees of Krishna said, no, we can't. Because surely we will go to hell for offering the, feet, the dust of our feet to God. How can you possibly Offer the feet, not even the feet, the dust of the feet to God. We will go to hell. We will be stricken with the worst karma for lifetimes. We can't give it. And when they went to Radha, she said, yes, yes, of course, take it, take it fast so that my beloved Krishna can be healed. And they said, but Radha, aren't you afraid? All of the other gopis and gopas and devotees, everybody was so afraid of going to hell for offering the dust of the feet to the Lord. And Radha said, I don't care. I don't care if I have to go to hell. I don't care what kind of bad karma I might get. Nothing matters. If I can offer anything to my Lord, that for me is heaven. So she's the embodiment of love, devotion, and that absolute unquestioning surrender. Whatever God asks of me, whether it's in line with what I think I should be doing, I mean, it's one thing to be a devotee who's singing and dancing with God. 
It's one thing to be a devotee who's sitting in the grass, listening to the Lord sing and play his flute. It's another thing to be doing that for God, which you think is going to end up sending you to hell. That is going to cause difficulty for you. And this is where Radha is that perfect embodiment of surrender. Whatever my Lord needs, whatever God wants of me, it's fun, great. It's not fun, no problem. It's glamorous and romantic, wonderful. It's not glamorous and romantic, no problem. It's what I always envisioned offering to God. Wonderful. It's not what I envisioned offering to God. No problem. That's the surrender. And that's what enabled her to be that one. And you're right. She wasn't the wife. And it's so interesting. We never say... Rukmini Krishna. We say Radha Krishna. And in Vrindavan, in fact, the way that everybody greets everyone is Radhe Radhe, Radhe Radhe, Radhe Radhe, because it is said that wherever Radha is, Krishna goes. Not where Rukmini is, not where the other 16,000 Wives were, but where Radha is, that love, that devotion is what pulls him. And this is where, for all of us, it's about how do we attain that. And really, it has to do with the surrender. It has to do with that purity. And as you asked about, you know, Men saying, oh, I do it and it's wrong, but Krishna does it and it's right. Well, there's actually a beautiful story from Puja Swamiji's childhood that I love. True story. His mother, when he was very, very young, had taken vows of brahmacharya, vows of celibacy. And when he was older not that much older. It was before he had left the home and gone to the jungle. So he was still only maybe, say, seven or so. They used to sleep on the rooftop in the night, in the summertime. And one night he woke up and he was thirsty and he went downstairs for a glass of water. And his mom was sleeping in the bedroom, but his father with all of the kids was sleeping on the roof. But when he went down to get water... His dad was knocking on his mom's door. And Puja Swamiji said, you know, at that time, I didn't really understand what was going on. It was only many years in retrospect that I understood what happened that night. Because the dad was knocking on the door, wanting to come inside. And Puja Swamiji's mom was saying, no, I've taken, I've taken vows, no. And Puja Swamiji's father was saying, but Krishna did it. And Puja Swamiji's mother from inside the room said, first become Krishna. Then come back and we'll talk. And this really points out, I mean, it it elucidates the core point, which is that all over people are saying, oh, well, Krishna did it. And yet, the truth is, when you really study it, Krishna was a child. The Ras Leela, this is not about, this is not sex. This is divine love. Radha was prepubescent. Krishna was a child. This was not, I mean, in the, in the paintings, in the imagery that we have, Yes, we typically have images of more adult forms. 
But actually, when you study it, they were children. This was not love and lust of the body. This was not sex and sensual pleasure. This was, this was coming together. The lover, the beloved, becoming one. That capital B beloved of God. Offering himself. As God in our scriptures tells us, in whatever form the devotee worships me, I appear to the devotee in that form. Well, so in the Ras Lila, we have Bhagwan Krishna cloning himself, appearing in a multitude of bodies. And again, in the, in the artistic imagery, the images all looked the same. But this is, this is just an example of what Krishna himself tells us, which is, I will appear in the form you worship me. And so all of these devotees were given this extraordinary experience of oneness with God. And of course, when we look at scriptures, the core question is, why? What is the message for us? And the message for us is, are you looking for ecstasy? Are you looking for that juicy life? The Ras Lila was singing, dancing. It wasn't austerity in the way we think of it. It wasn't eyes closed, just sitting like stone in meditation. It was ecstatic dance. Whirling, twirling, swirling all night underneath the full moon. That ecstasy comes to us when we surrender to God. With such love and such devotion that we feel God with us. And we allow God to take us up. If you've ever danced, you know, partner dancing, any kind of ballroom partner dancing, well, there has to be a leader. Someone has to lead. Someone has to follow. Traditionally, the man leads, the woman follows. Obviously, not always. But a dance works, a partner dance works, only when one is leading. If both partners are trying to lead, it ends up being very clumsy. And the message is, for that beautiful dance in life, let God lead. You want to be swept off your feet in love? No problem. God is waiting. Just let him lead. And that's, that's the ecstasy of the Ras Lila. And of course, then it's an intoxication, but an intoxication that stays with us even afterwards. So it's a, a beautiful opportunity to embrace. I was going to say to aspire for, but we don't even really need to aspire. It's, it's there for us. We just have to be open to it. What Radha was, it's not about her skin was a different shade. It's not about her body measurements were different. It's not about the money in her bank account or the cast of her family members. It's not about what she achieved. It's that surrender. It's that total love, total devotion, total surrender to God. And so as we, as we enter the eve of Radhashtami, what a beautiful opportunity to open our hearts to that love. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network.
Om Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth radio is conscious living for your soul. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. The veil of Maya operates on so many levels. Maya is outside. Maya is illusion. That's what it means, the illusion. Maya exists in my understanding of the outer world, of the illusory way that I am attracted to the outer world. So, for example, I can close my eyes and Maya is still there. I can pull a sheet over my head and Maya is still there. I can put on a pair of, you know, an eye mask, and Maya is still there. So it's not just in the outer world. Maya is in how I interact with that outer world. And the only way to go deep is to change the way that I am seeing to change my vision rather than allowing my vision to be covered with the veil. Maya says, look at me over here. Look at how glittery and beautiful I am. Look at this world of money. Look at this world of fame. Look at this world of possessions. Look at this world of sensual pleasures. Maya's over here saying, look at me, come toward me, enjoy me, taste me. I'm wonderful. I'm the, the pleasures. That's the, the allure of Maya. But along with that, the illusion is, and you are separate from me. I'm over here, all the pleasures, the enjoyment. You are separate. And I'm going to pull you toward me. I'm going to fill you with desire for me. That's the allure of this wily Maya. And she operates in the illusion. That A, who I am already is not enough. That my greatest joy and bliss doesn't come from within. That there is separation in the world. That that which I want, that which I need, is out there somewhere. In the glittery world of pleasures and enjoyment. Or the glittery world of prosperity. That somehow I am separate from my own fullness. That I am separate from joy. 
the way to be free of that veil of Maya. It's always trying to distract us over here. Look at me, look at me, look at me. The way to do that is we drop deeply inward into the place that is truth. If Maya is illusion, falsehood, the antidote to that is truth. So instead of trying to push away Maya, my role is not to stand over here and to say, go away, go away, get away, get away. But just to stand over here. I can see her dancing over there. I can see her playing her games. I can see that that glittery, dancey, alluring presence. But I recognize that like the pool of water in the desert, it's a mirage. Looks very beautiful from a distance. But the closer you get to it, thinking, ah, now I'm going to get what I want. Now I'm getting what I want. Now I'm close to this achievement. It gets farther and farther and farther. And if you find yourself just ready to pounce on it and really grab it and get it, you realize, oh, it never actually existed. And that's where in this world of Maya, it's never enough. No matter how much money we make, no matter how much pleasure we have, no matter how much enjoyment, no matter how much success or fame or beauty, it's never enough. That's Maya's game. It's like you never can get right up to that pool of water in the desert. It's just going to keep pulling you closer and closer as you lose your last bit of life breath, as you lose your last bit of life force trying to get there to that pool in the desert. And at the very end, it dissipates into the world of illusion from which it came. And so the way around that is that we actually see the truth. We actually find the truth because when I can see the truth, I'm not allured by an illusion. You can't trick me if my eyes are open. If I'm blindfolded, you can trick me. But not if my eyes are open. You can convince me that that rope on the ground is a snake if the lights are off. But the minute the lights are on, you no longer can convince me that that rope is a snake. And so in our spiritual practice, we turn on the light. We really courageously look at the truth, even when it's not fun, even when it's not nearly as glittery or allurey as Maya, but we look at it. And in that truth, we find a peace and a fullness and a joy that makes all of the allure of Maya not have any hold on us. It's almost like we get covered with, you know, beautiful ghee or something. And so nothing, nothing can actually stick to us because we've seen the truth. So whether it's through your, your meditation, your introspection, your scriptural study, whatever your introspective spiritual practice may be, use that. Use that to go within and find the truth. You can always start with the very simple, the very simple way of just, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Because if I'm, if I'm lacking 
I need something from outside. If I'm not enough, I need something. But when I really experience the fullness of who I am, then Maya's got nothing for me. There's nothing Maya can offer me that's worth pulling me out of the truth of the self. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. OM Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Do you have time to read that inspiring book or that blog post you've been meaning to get to? In your busy world, how do you improve yourself and keep your life going? I'm Lisa Kay, and my Between Heaven and Earth radio show can transform your life just by listening. Be uplifted with inspiring topics, positive stories, and ideas that really work. Between Heaven and Earth Radio is conscious living for your soul. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. Like Baldwin with people for the ethical treatment of animals. I grew up loving circuses and other traveling animal shows, but it never occurred to me what life might be like for the animals. Training wild animals to do things they don't understand takes force. Routine discipline with a hook or whip with the heel of a boot shows the animal exactly who's the boss. Don't patronize animal acts. Please contact people for the ethical treatment of animals. 757-622-PETA Welcome back. This is Sadvi Bhagavati Saraswati with inspiration and transformation. So first of all, We are definitely not sent to earth because of our sins. A human birth is considered the highest, the pinnacle of spiritual evolution. It's a gift, it's a blessing. There is a, a law of karma that says that the circumstances that we're given in each, in each life are given to us so that we can take our next step closer to the divine. The circumstances that we're given, the situations that we're put in, are not a punishment by any means. Certainly being here is not a punishment. The circumstances that we're given are those that are the most conducive based on all of our karmic package from lifetimes. Because of course this lifetime's karma, we only start accruing it once we once we start acting. So when you think about things that happen long before we've done any karma in this life, the situation we're born in, family we're born in, circumstances we're born in, the physical package we're born in, so what culture, what race, what color, but also physically all of our genetic makeup, all of the, the aspects genetically of things that chances are we'll be good at or not good at, skills, abilities, a lot of that is what we learn, but a lot of that is genetic as well. Different people are born with different innate abilities for maybe music, maybe art, maybe math. That whole package is based on all of our past karmic package, past karma. But it's not about punishment for a sin. 
the whole point is for us to awaken, for us to finally realize who it is within us that keeps coming back and keeps doing this. They say that if you can imagine a mountain that I think it's a mile high and a mile wide, maybe more even, but I think it's a mile high and a mile wide. And once every hundred years, a bird flies past that mountain with a silk scarf in its beak. And that silk scarf flies across the mountain, touches the mountain once every hundred years. The amount of time that it will take that silk scarf to erode the mountain, the mountain that, remember, is a mile high and a mile wide, The amount of time that it will take that silk scarf to erode it, that is how long we have been coming back and coming back and coming back. One soul, one capital S self, coming back in different bodies, different circumstances, different situations to keep working through our karma, to finally get, to finally get to that place of awakening. So the human birth is considered the the pinnacle, the best, the gift. Because in a human birth, we are able to be conscious of consciousness. Animals, it is assumed, just do their thing. Dog is barking down there. But he's not conscious of, now I'm barking. Is this an appropriate time to be barking? What has stimulated my barking? How do people around me feel about my barking? Why am I barking now when other dogs aren't barking? What's this whole barking thing going on? It just barks. It's not even aware that there is a capital D dogness that's just watching the barking. Humans are the only ones who have that, it's believed, who have that ability to be conscious. And through that consciousness, we have the ability to attain enlightenment to actually experience that truth of why we're here. So this birth is by far not a punishment. It is, however, believed that we will keep coming back until we have that ultimate experience, until we attain what we call moksha or freedom. Freedom from the confines of the mind. Freedom from the ignorance. Freedom from this idea that I am this physical body. That I am this particular life's history. This particular life's color or culture or race or religion. Freedom from that. Freedom from the mind. Freedom from thinking I am angry. I am jealous. I am depressed. I am better than, worse than. Freedom from all of that. And ultimately when we do, it's believed that we don't come back. That we just attain that ultimate formless oneness with God. But the truth is that it's not the body that is actually keeping us stuck. And so, Puja Swamiji, for example, and other enlightened masters have said, we're going to keep coming back. This isn't a prison for us. 
we are coming back on purpose. Coming back to serve, coming back to help, coming back to carry other people across that ocean. So being here on earth in form is not the bondage. The bondage is in the mind. And so whether you attain awakening in this particular life, in this particular body, or you die, take a new body, you attain it in that body, don't wait thinking that when you attain moksha, then you won't have to have a body, then you'll just be formless with God. But rather, realize that when you attain moksha, that is when this body, this life, becomes a blessing. That is when our senses become this way for us, not to be a slave, not to be imprisoned, not to respond to our senses in ways that we later regret or in ways that bring us lower in our karma or our dharma, not in ways that foster ignorance, but rather in ways that are full of gratitude for the creation, ways that enable us just to experience the smell of the roses, the sound of the rushing waters of Mother Ganga, the touch, the touch of the rain on our skin, the touch of the sun on our skin. That's when the body becomes an extraordinary blessing. So don't think that having the body or being here is the punishment. The mind is the problem. And this is where we have this life to learn, to work with the mind. God created us in this divine lila to give us the opportunity to come back home. Because if we're just nothing but undivided, formless soul, there's no coming home. And there's something very exquisite about coming back, about coming home. And so God has has created Two out of one. Seven billion out of one. To give seven billion, well, seven billion humans an infinite number when you take all species. The possibility of the joy of coming back home. This brings to a close this hour of inspiration and transformation. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be together with you all each week. And I look forward to being together again next Thursday, same time on Ohm Times Radio. Mm-hmm.